Hi, my name is Ben Feist, and welcome to my home office. I'm a software developer, and I've spent 25 years in the advertising industry at different agencies of various shapes and sizes. But I want to tell you today a little bit about the work that I've done from this home office over the years, outside of work, just because I wanted to do it. I decided I wanted to help restore the historical record of the Apollo program. Between 1969 and 1972, humanity landed on the moon six times, and I found it all very fascinating. The historical record was there, but it was trapped in old print documents and analog tapes and film reels stored in archives across the United States. And I wanted to bring this crazily interesting material back to life. The internet is an amazing thing, and there are still no rules as much as we try to pretend that there are. And with a blank slate, how could you best express this historical data? Well, I thought, why not make the mission play back? Maybe there's a way to play it. And I mean, that's a pretty straightforward idea. But what if I made it all playback? There's no real reason to edit things down. Why summarize everything into a 90-minute film or a 30-second TV spot, for that matter? What would it be like if you could play back the whole mission as it occurred? So I started with Apollo 17, which is the last mission to the moon. And the reason I started with that one is that it, its historical material wasn't in the best of shape. So I decided to try to tackle this because I am a generalist, as you have to be in an agency. And I figured I might have a unique set of skills that I could apply to these problems and hack my way through the restoration process. I decided I would make the whole project about when things occurred during the mission. So if I could timestamp all the different mediums, then maybe there's something I could do to try to connect it all together. So I digitized and corrected the mission transcript using all the source audio, and I synced all the TV broadcasts and onboard film shot during the mission. I timed every photo using the transcript and TV broadcasts as references. And, you know, we're talking about a lot of material. There were 2,400 photos, and the transcript was 2,500 pages long. I had made a new friend at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center who provided me with high-resolution data gathered by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter of Apollo 17's landing site on the moon. Using this data, I created 3D renderings of the path the crew took when they drove the lunar rover around on the surface. I pulled all of this together into a 302 hour long premiere project, the length of the actual Apollo 17 mission. All of this historical research, data cleaning and 3D rendering had taken me six years. And I was just doing this all for fun. I mean, I wanted to see if I could help with this historical material, but really it was just to try to unwind after work, after working in agency life all day. This is what I would do when I got home, uh, just to spend an hour or so at a time just to see if this was something I could work on. And it was like a refueling process. It's, it's something I was doing for myself, and I didn't really know if anybody else would even care that I was doing it. I had no real idea what the end product would be while I was doing all of this, and I quit the project many times, but the material was so interesting it kept pulling me back. By definition, a hobby is a job that you can quit anytime you want, but a hobby is also supposed to be a topic of something that you're interested in, so that's why it would pull me back. So there was no sense of having a deadline or uh, anything that would make this uh, another job. And if it got too overwhelming or was too consuming of my thoughts, then I would just step away and take some time away. And nobody knew what I was doing. I wasn't making a big deal out of it, save letting a few people know in the space history world that I was doing this just because I didn't want anybody else to be doing it. And it would be a huge duplicated effort. What a waste of time that would have been. It was finally time to face the music for the most challenging part building the website, which is what I do for a living. But this interactive website would have to play back the mission in real time. So TV segments appeared when they were shot and the transcript scrolls kind of like closed captioning and photos appear as they're taken. And if the famous photo appears, it doesn't get any special treatment. If the next photo happens, it goes right over top. It was like the mission was reanimated when I pulled all this together. It was somehow alive again. And when I finished, I contacted my friend at Goddard and told him that I had made something with all this data he gave me and sent him a link to the prototype. And he responded immediately saying that I just had to come down to NASA to give a presentation about this work. And I couldn't believe it. I thought, aren't there already people at NASA that are doing things like this? I mean, I just did this for fun and it's not at the level of quality that I would expect to come out of something at NASA. And he explained, there is nobody else doing anything like this. And if you come down, this is a great demonstration of an unexpected use of the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter data. So I gave a presentation on the anniversary of the launch of Apollo 17 at Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. 
I gave it my best pitch effort. Years of presenting to tough rooms in the ad industry had prepared me. I wasn't selling anything in this case, but if NASA was going to invite me to talk, I was going to do my best. After the presentation, I was relieved. It was over. I had finished. Uh, it was such a great experience, and everybody had been so friendly. Um, but I also met a group of scientists afterwards, and they explained to me that what I had built might be the solution to a problem that NASA had. It turns out that pulling multidisciplinary data together in a unified system was a tough problem, and this time-based view might be the answer. I think I said, I'm glad to hear that NASA might do something with this idea. I had no idea I was contributing anything. And they said, we're not going to do something with it. You are. And in that meeting, they invited me to participate in one of their astronaut training exercises in the New Mexico desert. These are called field analogs, where they develop skills and procedures that will be used when humanity visits other planets. I couldn't believe they were asking me. They definitely had the wrong guy. You know, I'm just an advertising guy. The things that I make don't last long on the internet. You know, campaigns come and go. I'm certainly not a trained aerospace engineer or anything like that. There's certainly more qualified people in the world than me as developers. I'm a bit of a hack, if I'm honest. But I said yes on the spot. If they were going to invite me to come and help, I knew I could help clients with problems. And if they thought I might be able to help them, I was going to try. A few months later, I found myself standing in the desert in New Mexico with a team of scientists and astronaut instructors, along with astronaut Butch Wilmore, former commander of the International Space Station. Even crazier than that, at 82 years old, Jack Schmidt, lunar module pilot of Apollo 17, the only scientist to ever walk on the moon, joined us in the field. I had listened to Jack's voice for all those years while working in my home office, and now here we were in the field together. Over the following year, I took every opportunity I was given to make things and put them forward. Eventually, I got a phone call asking if I'd be interested in working with NASA on a full-time basis. They said it was getting too complicated explaining my background and it would be easier if you just worked here. Once again, I said yes. Now I'm working on a variety of projects at NASA, including a playback system that will be used in mission control on the International Space Station program and the upcoming Return to the Moon with the Artemis program. But I didn't stop making Apollo websites on the side. After two years of effort, this past summer I launched Apollo 11 in real time and had over a million people from 224 different countries tune in to watch the mission exactly 50 years later to the second. And right now, Apollo 13 is live exactly 50 years later. This ill-fated mission suffered an explosion on board that caused them to cancel the lunar landing and mission control snapped into action to find a way to bring them home. This was an incredible achievement by the people in mission control and they were awarded the Medal of Freedom for their work. And through this website for the first time, people are able to dive in and actually witness them doing their jobs. These multimedia experiences didn't just lead to my new career, they've turned out to be very popular with the public. How is this even possible? What would I have said back at my digital agency if someone approached me with a concept of hundreds of hours of unedited material? Would I have predicted that it would work? That it would spread by word of mouth and millions of people would flock to it? The big digital players have been pushing us into shorter and shorter media formats, snackable content. I hate that term. That's what they use. And we're used to being in these little pigeonholes and digital is about short attention spans and it is not. It doesn't have to be that way. The fact that this worked at all goes to show that the internet still has no rules. You don't know until you try. Thanks very much for listening. I hope everyone stays safe and happy Apollo 13 anniversary.